Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 28th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discussed the recent push to make subsidies for child care the next must-have state program. Second, we discussed the recent wholesale change out by the Dunleavy administration of all of the key players on fiscal policy and why that's a concern for this coming legislative session. And third, we comment on a recent strange defense of House Finance Committee member Representative Will Stapp's position on fiscal issues. And now let's join Michael. All right, Brad. Well, let's uh, let's dive into this here and get started. Child care is the new must have. It is the must see TV Thursday of politics right now. Tell me about child care. All right. So this last week has been interesting. If you're following the press and the editorial pages and, and things like that, child care and the need for state subsidization of child care, federal uh, government subsidization, some government subsidization of child care is just sort of just sort of exploded. It's, it's tied to uh, a statement by the Alaska Chamber of Commerce, uh, that bastion of private enterprise and, and, oh, yeah. and you know, reduced government role. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. The Alaska Chamber of Commerce uh, weighing in with a report uh, during a meeting of the, during a session of the governor's uh, uh, commission on child care or, the, or the, his task force on child care. And the, and the new Alaska Chamber position is, as announced at, at the meeting, was the Alaska Chamber encourages the Alaska legislature, governor, and congressional delegation to work with the business community to identify fiscally responsible reforms to the child care system. So that sort, of, that sort of gets the ball rolling. And that's picked up both in an ADN uh, article uh, and as well in an Alaska public media uh, article, both of which focus on the Alaska Chamber's call for child care. The news miner, not to be left behind <laughs> or not to be left out of it, does an op-ed, did an op-ed this past week on the subject, the challenge of affordable quality child care in Alaska that includes this, this statement. The news miner certainly knows the state must find workable ways to subsidize, this is the news miner, to subsidize childcare workers that often struggle to find the means to cover costs for their own families and goes on to talk about how the state should inject uh, additional subsidies into the child care system to support uh, these child care workers. Not to be outdone, not to be left behind, Senator Murkowski uh, down in Ketchikan during a Ketchikan visit and a discussion with the Ketchikan Daily News uh, says this, during a visit to the first city earlier this month, Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski talked with the Daily News about the growing recognition uh, of the importance of child care to economic development among constituents and lawmakers alike, and said that there is hunger for actions on both sides of, of the aisle, and goes on to talk about the need for a federal role, uh, as well as a state role in uh, in supporting uh, uh, child care workers. So, we 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 had we've had the 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 run up to K twelve the BSA we need more BSA spending that's going to hit us when we when we get into the next session we, we there was been a session this past week uh, that involved Kathy Giesel and Chuck Kopp, who's the lobbyist for the uh, for the unions the employees unions 
um, you know, pushing defined benefits and, and making presentations on why defined benefits uh, an increase in define or a return to defined benefits is important uh, uh, for Alaska, you know, resulting in additional costs. We have the never ending push for increased spending uh, at the university. Uh, and now we have, now we're layering on with, with an equal amount of push uh, behind it. You know, the Alaska Chamber lining up behind it, the, the, the business community lining up behind it, an equal amount of push for, um, uh, for, for child care subsidization. Here's, here's an interesting factoid that came out of all this. Uh, in, the, in the chamber presentation, to uh, uh, to the to Governor Dunleavy's child care uh, task force. This is from the chamber. We found that about 152 million dollars are missing from the Alaska economy because of people choosing not to be in the workforce or, or working less. And the Alaska public media defines that as a major takeaway. The stu- state is losing a lot of money annually because of the shortage of child care. And referencing this this discussion of $152 million a year missing from the Alaska economy. Oh. You know how much PFD cuts are? No, just, just, oh. I mean, my head, oh. my head is exploding, just the exploding over this. Over I mean, the last, over the last five years. Now, now keep in mind this $152 million missing from the Alaska economy, the private sector of the Alaska economy. And keep in mind the Alaska public public media's, characterization of that as a lot of money annually because of the shortage of child care. PFD cuts per year over the last five years, even with the big year that where we where we where the legislature came close to paying the statutory dividend, didn't get there, but came close, even including that year. PFD cuts have been $1.05 billion a year. I was just going to say, you want to help employees? You want to help people who provide child care? You want to help everybody? How about you just give them their full statutory PFD? That'd go a long way to helping those people find child care and those providing it to be able to live and do all those other things. I mean, it's just this, it, this is madness, absolute madness. I mean, what is the, you've got the Chamber of Commerce, ostensibly the free market conservative solution to everything in Alaska. And yet they're going back to the government hat in hand to say, you've got to fix this. After, by the way, they advocated for you, for them to hold back all the PFD money so that their diamond level contributors could make sure they keep getting their filthy government lucre in their coffers, right? I mean, that's what it all comes down to. Yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing. I mean, it's it's. It, I don't think AP. I don't think the Alaska public media has ever described the amount of PFD cuts, the amount that's being taken out of the private sector of the economy, shifted to the government sector of the economy, and redistributed by twenty one plus eleven plus one. I don't think that the the Alaska public media has ever described that as as a lot of money. But here we got one hundred and fifty two million dollars. What is that? About an eighth. Of, of, of what the PFD cut is annually. And all of a sudden that's a lot of money. And all of a sudden the government's got to fix that. The government's got to fix that because, you know, my gosh, we can't, we can't tap the private sector to, 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 you know, come up with $152 million to, to help out, to, to help out childcare. I mean, we can't tap the employers who, you know, are complaining about this and, 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 and want government to solve it. We can't tap them to, to pay for it. The, the other the other interesting thing in all this is is no one, not the Alaska, uh, not not uh, uh, the chamber, not the uh, ADN who runs the story, not the uh, Alaska public media, certainly not the Fairbanks newsbiter who is who is openly advocating for government subsidies, uh, and not Senator Murkowski. None of them address who pays for for these these additional funds. That that come into the come into the economy, and we know what that means, or these additional funds that that, that government needs to, to to subsidize into the private economy. We know what that means. That means it's going to come out of additional PFD cuts, because nobody's talking about alternative measures to the to the measure that the legislature has relied on for the last what, seven years now. Uh, nobody's talking about alternatives. Nobody's talking about an alternative way of paying for it. So what we're really talking about is taking money out of middle and lower income Alaska families, which you know the the all the reports are 
oh, we're worried about lower and middle income Alaska families because, you know, they need child care in order to in order to be able to get in the workforce. What we're really talking about is taking money out of lower and middle income Alaska families and giving it to other, giving it to government. So government can then subsidize specific sectors of, of the economy because the because the private sector doesn't want to do that, even though the private sector benefits, even though the private sector would get the and employers and businesses, all these people who don't pay taxes um, would benefit out of the one hundred and fifty two million dollars of, of additional act, of additional activity that they claim would would occur, even though they benefit. They don't want to pay for it. They want they want by by their silence. They are leaving it up to additional cuts to the PFD to to, to create this money. So it's it's it, it is bad on so many levels. Yeah, <laughs> that, absolutely. That, 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 that I lose track of it after a while. Yeah. But 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 the dollars involved, the 152 million, when you compare that to the level of PFD cuts, that really brings it home for me. I mean, that really brings home, you know, how 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 the media will pick out these and how the chamber, how the how the top 20% in the business community will pick out these issues that, oh, I need a government subsidy for that. I don't want to pay for that. I need a government right. subsidy for that. Um, and and I need, you know, I need additional PFD cuts to pay for that. Uh, all the while, you know, just continuing down the road of taking money out of the very out of the out of the out of the bank accounts of the very people that they claim that they're that they're you know doing this for well and no talk of how we could make child care easier in the state no talk of restrictions reducing government regulation uh pulling back on the bureaucracy of oversight and everything else i mean those are all things they've that's all been cited there have been news media articles here in the last three or four months about the difficulty in becoming a state certified child care worker and the hoops and the loops and everything you have to do, the costs involved and everything else. No wonder nobody wants to participate, but there's no discussion about making it easier, making it more streamlined, making it more efficient for people to do that. Instead, we have to look to government to pull more money out of the private economy to go ahead and fix this. And it's just it's, I mean, it is the state of the state right now. We're creating a dependency cycle. And none of this even touches on the deeper issues of how fast and how many times the money turns in the economy, you know, a billion dollars every year that's being lost in that, you know, that that could turn five, six, seven times, you know, oh no, we're going to take another 154, 152 billion that is, you know, and, and by the way, Anthony, I think, nails it here. Anthony says 152 million isn't being generated by those people who choose to work less or not work and don't take and, and instead take care of their kids. It probably costs five times that for those people to hire child, child care. And that's what the government wants a bite of the pie. You know, everybody needs to go to work and be good little worker bees and don't choose to take care of your own kids. Maybe you can't afford it. And then Capozzi has the. Katie Capozzi from the human or from the uh, uh, from the chamber, at one of the comments in the Beacon article says one of the pieces of the study that stood out to Capozzi is even a third of families that make more than a hundred thousand dollars a year annually struggle with child care. Well, maybe we should talk about some classes on family financial counseling and budgeting if you can't do that with a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, that it's it's nutty. It's like they're trying to bridge the gap to say, oh, this is across all medians and all so what we need to do is go to the altar of government and worship there and allow them to drop us a steaming pile of 152 million to subsidize that this is madness this is absolutely insane i mean a dependency state that's where we're at right now it was well, a dependency state by it, it, it you know sort of the lack of understanding of this is just is just sort of staggering it's a dependency state not not Funded by all Alaska families, not funded broadly, not tapping into non-residents who, you know, every other of the of the 50 states, 49 states plus the District of Columbia, tap into non-residents to, to provide a part of the revenue to run their to run their state government because non-residents benefit to a degree from the government. They tap into that revenue source. In Alaska, in Alaska, not only are we saying we need all this dependency. But we need it all financed from this from middle and lower income Alaska families. We need it financed from the very people that, that can afford it the least. The, you know, we say that we're doing it for their benefit. We say that you're that we're, you know, that's why we need dependency. That's why we need government programs to take care of, take care of these people. But at the same time, we're taking more money out of 
their their hides through PFD cuts uh, than the than the services that uh, that are being given back to. So it's it's a uh, it, 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 we've gotten ourselves all tangled up from a fiscal standpoint. We've gotten ourselves all tangled up uh, in the way that we're financing these these things. Sure, you know the the top the those earning more than a hundred thousand dollars, which are the top twenty percent. Sure, you know free childcare. Oh, that'd be or subsidized childcare. That'd be great. Hey, let's do that. They don't have to pay for it. <laughs> it's 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 another free government good to them. And I'm sure that that you know there are people who came to the come to the child care task force meeting, people who come to the come to the uh, 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 chamber meetings, and you know go on and on and on about how this is really for the common good and how this is really you know benefiting Alaska and how this will make Alaska great. Fine, it's going to make Alaska great if it's really benefiting all Alaskans. Let's tap all Alaskans to pay for it. Right. But let's not focus it on on lower and middle income Alaska families like like we've been doing for everything else. And now we evidently propose to do this again for, for childcare. Uh, I'm going to continue with Anthony's thought. Cause he then went on to say, I mean, without all these finable arbitrary codes and regulations, the dirty pores are going to figure out that they can just watch kids for free amongst their respective communities. And then who's going to pay for all the services. But here's the thing. This is what I'm talking about for a dependency situation. They want to create all these subsidies so that these people then start being dependent on the government to pay for those things. And they create it creates more of a government things that they may have done for free or for cash under the table or for things without all that oversight. They would have done it for I mean, it's going to make them more dependent on that government spend, which begets more government spend in the long run. I mean, that's that's the whole point. This is a growth of government cycle like I don't think I've ever seen in my lifetime. Ten seconds, Brad. We're well, and lower and middle income Alaska families can't protect themselves because because the money's being taken out by the legislature before, you know, it's being is being diverted before it gets to those families. And they can't Absolutely. stop the government from doing that. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I want to get on to number two, but Brad, just final thoughts on number three. I mean, this really is a dependency cycle that is being paid for by the middle and lower class of Alaskan workers. That's really when it's all said and done, this is a dependent, they wanna create it where people may have provided it free or low, you know, cash under the table, pretty cheap or whatever. They want them to become dependent on that government subsidy to do it and create a whole nother level of dependency in the state. And again, paid for by somebody who's not them, right? Right. And, and, and Zach Fields even goes further. Zach Fields has a bill in to unionize, so to create a union of, of child care workers so that they can negotiate as a union with the government for the amount of the subsidy that the, that the child care workers would, would then need. So it is. It's, I mean, it, everybody's sort of jumping on it for their own personal advantage. Zach wants a union out of it because he rep, represents unions, uh, is employed by unions, represents unions. Uh, you know, uh, other people want it because they people in the top, you know, twenty percent want it because they want another government service that that is free to them. Everybody has has you know an idea about how this all benefits them. But the only people paying for it, if you use PFD cuts, the only people paying for it are middle and lower income Alaska families, the very people that you're claiming that you're doing this for. It's a it, it's a it's a screwed up mess. Right, right. All right, number 2 is the revolving door that appears to be the Dunleavy administration. As I said earlier, it's either rats leaving a sinking ship or something else is going on and I'm not quite sure what. You've noticed a trend amongst the fiscal players in the governor's administration. Brad hit me with it. So there there are four key players. Um uh primary players on the administration side. Uh, in terms of fiscal policies, the, the commissioner of the Department of Revenue, the deputy commissioner of the Department of Revenue, who is, sort of runs the, the ship on a day-to-day -day basis, the director of the tax division of the Department of Revenue, which is you know responsible for for administering the programs that bring in revenue, uh, and then the director of the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, who's really the the person in in, in, in responsible for corralling things on the cost side. So you got the revenue side with the commissioner of revenue, deputy commissioner, and the um, uh, the director of tax, and you've got the director of OMB uh, on the on the cost side. Since the governor was reelected, uh, well, I can't remember when Crum got appointed, but but in the in the past year, um, there the, there's been a complete change now in all four of those positions, 
Adam Crum came in as, well, it was after the governor got reelected. Adam Crum came in as uh, uh, commissioner of revenue, the new commissioner of revenue. Shortly after that, uh, or sometime after that, the deputy commissioner of revenue, uh, uh, Brian Fector, uh, was pushed out. Uh, who, and Brian's now gone to the state of Washington to be the bu- budget director for, uh, for the governor in the state of Washington. Uh, was pushed out by, by the administration. Then the director of tax, uh, Colleen Glover, was, was pushed out. Uh, uh, no, one, no one's claiming this was their you know, choice, that, that they were rats le- leaving a sinking ship. They were pushed out. Uh, Colleen was, was pushed out, and she's not been uh, replaced yet. That role's not been replaced. They're still an acting director of, uh, of the Department of Tax. And now, uh, la- late last week, we, the, uh, uh, there, was, there was a rumor going around that ultimately got confirmed by the Alaska landmine, and then an article that confirmed it in Must Read Alaska that the director of OMB, uh, Neil Steiniger, has been, had been, has been pushed out by the administration. Again, no claim that it was you know, his own volition, that it was rats leaving a sinking ship, it was, he was pushed out. Um, and, and so all four of the positions, all four of the key positions uh, from a fiscal standpoint are changing. And three of them, the, 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 you know, where the boots hit the ground, uh, the, the deputy director of, or the deputy commissioner, the director of the division of tax and the director of OMB, three of them have been pushed out involuntarily. Now, the, the Dunleavy administration has announced a replacement for, or has do ha, does have a replacement for Deputy Commissioner of Revenue. They did announce uh, yesterday a replacement for the Director of OMB. Um, so they're they're filling these slots. The Director of Tax is still not filled, but they're filling these slots. But but why are they why are they replacing these people? Brian had been in the administration in various roles since really the beginning of the Dunleavy administration. Um, uh, Colleen had been there since the very beginning. She was the director of tax that Governor Dunleavy appointed when he was first elected. Uh, Neil had been there since uh, Donna had departed after the first year of the Dunleavy administration. So had been there for the last three of the first year of the of the of the first administration and had continued on into the into the second administration. It, 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 there's just something there's something curious about about what's going on here and what and what it means to fiscal policy. This comes at a at a particularly important. I mean, we're in the fall here, right? So, the the Dunleavy administration is getting its proposals together for the coming budget, and the Dunleavy administration is getting its proposals together on the revenue side. And this is a particularly important session we're coming up on. Uh, we, we are clearly running deficits, even with higher oil prices, as you and I discussed in the previous show, even with higher oil prices, we're still running huge deficits uh, uh, over the next decade, and both in the current year and, and over the next decade against, against the statutory obligations of the state. Huge deficits. That's even before you layer on K through 12, defined benefits, more for the university, child care. That's even before you layer on additional spending. We're running huge deficits. The governor has clearly indicated that he's not going to cut spend that he's not going to cut spending back to traditional levels. He's had several sessions in which he could do that. He's not done it. Last year, he finally faced up to the to the deficits and said, "Well, we're going to have to talk about sales taxes. We're going to have to talk about you know a, a fiscal plan and 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 getting this all under control." But sales, but he never he never came out with the sales tax bill sort of leaving Ben Carpenter dangling in the wind, who had come out with the sales tax bill on the House side, never came out with the sales tax bill and never and then has has said he's not going to have the fiscal session, the special session this fall that he'd originally said he was going to have last spring. So, you know, we're come we're crashing into this next session with deficits galore, with with people pushing for increased spending, with no fiscal plan. And for the and and the governor's going to have to address that in the budget. I mean, he's going to have to come up with a plan that says this is how we're going to work our way out of this set. Because the other thing that's happened in the meantime is we've drained the earnings reserve through the eight billion dollars that that that's Bert that Bert's moved back into the corpus. We've drained uh, we've drained the earning we've drained the earnings earnings reserve. So that's not really a backup anymore. The governor's going to have to come to this session and have a and have a fiscal plan that's going to have to include revenues. It's going to have to include some discussion of revenues, whether whether it's making permanent PFD cuts 
and using that as the revenue source to balance the budget or alternative lower impact, more equitable revenue sources, he's going to have to come with revenues. And, and in the in the part of the year when all of this needs to be coming together, when the plans need to be forming, he's changing out the entire team. <laughs> he's changed out the deputy director. He's changed out the, the, the director of the division of tax. And now he's changed out the, the OMB director. And it's, and it's just not clear what the heck's going on. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of confusion both inside the administration from, from what I can gather, as well as certainly on the outside about what the governor's up to. Critical time critical time to have a solid, seasoned, experienced, balanced team together to be putting together, you know, a response to where we're headed, a plan for, for where we should be headed in response to response to these deficits that just, you know, go on ad infinitum. Um, clearly a critical time and we're, and we're changing out the team. So it's, it's, it's a lot of concern on, on, on my part. And I think on the part of others who are concerned about, uh, about the state's fiscal situation. No, I mean, it is very, very concerning because we don't have a plan and the players that uh, seem to have been part of the older guard that may have had um, kind of that more, let's find streamlines, let's find some cuts, let's do some things. They've all been let go. Uh, It's intimated in the uh, article in the Juno Empire that potentially this is all a setup to maybe find a cushy job in a potential Trump administration. I don't know if it's a uh, if it's a way to, you know, shine himself up for the uh, uh, but it, it's ironic that <clears throat> the Republican Party, supposedly the po- the car- party of smaller, more responsible government, that somehow by creating more government spending, that's going to endear him to that. I mean, it, it but that's again, that's where we are in Alaska. You've got a split and divided party. The powers that be in the party are all about more government spend and subsidies and all this other stuff. And the other half is still wanting to have cuts. And and he seems to be leaning more in the other way of the old guard. Yeah, it's not, it's not clear, Michael, what way he's leaning in. I mean, Lacey Sanders, who's who he's announced as the replacer to Ste- as the replacement to Steiniger, is is a good bureaucrat as she's been her entire career. She's worked as a budget al- analyst either on, on the part of various administrations in various uh, departments, uh, or she's worked with uh, uh, Ledge Finance over on the legislative side. Uh, career, but she's had her entire career has been in administering budgets, uh, looking after budgets, explaining budgets, uh, uh, building budgets. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not been in it's not been in, you know, cutting costs or, or bringing programs under control or or doing things, uh, doing things of that nature. So you've got you, you brought in another person who's good at, you know, adding up numbers and, and making nice charts and and presenting them in front of uh, in front of committees. But you're not you've not brought in a person who has a history of, of bringing things under control. So it's it's it, 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 it's not clear what that message sends. But right. but it's but it's 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 confusion. I mean, so let's go back to Brian Fector. Brian Fector was was the person who is respond who was in OMB and responsible for writing a number of the government's fiscal plans uh, in the first part of the administration. Right. The second the second year of the administration, he wrote what I think is the best ten year plan, the best ten year outlook, the best fiscal plan that this state's ever had, and it talked about the all of the above that we were going to have to do some cuts, we were going to have to do some PFD restructuring, and we were going to have to do some revenues uh, to, to help uh, to help deal with uh, government spending and talk about and talked about broad based revenues. And he's and he's consistently had that voice through the administration. Well, he's gone. <laughs> Colleen Glover, who who stood up to oil companies, knew the oil industry from her time uh, in private industry before she came in as director of tax stood up to the industry, told the industry at times that, no, you weren't going to be able to get away with that interpretation of the statute that let you that let you go short on your taxes. Uh, audited, was responsible for auditing the, the, the companies, had, uh, was known in, internally as pressing for additional uh, uh, looks at taxation, uh, additional looks at revenue, uh, pressing the oil companies further. She's gone. Neil Steiniger, <laughs> who... Who you know was was not the was not the most assertive of the of of the three, but Neil Steiniger, who had a reputation for looking at the budget and you know trying to find efficiencies and that sort of stuff, uh, sort of following on to what Donna had done, he's gone. 
And and it's just I we're we're not the, the Dunleavy administration is not it, it's like you take the pilots out of the plane, right? As as you're approaching turbulence, as you're approaching, you know, what what all this training has been for, what all of this preparation has been for, what all this thought has been for, as you're approaching the the final turbulence, finally getting coming to a reckoning with all this, you take all the pilots out of the plane and you, and you put new people new people in the cockpit. They may be they may be a, a, a capable pilots, but it's they don't have the experience, the build up, the 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 advocacy, the understanding of where the, of what the state's fiscal situation is uh, that we that we had with the the people that were in place. So it's 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 sending a very confusing mes- message and a very concerning message as we approach what I think is going to be a very critical session about uh, about the state's uh, look forward. And we see the writing and disdain that uh, the Juno Empire and other people, uh, other news media outlets have had for anybody that may have been of the ilk of, uh, you know, kind of the uh, efficiency, the cut. Uh, They uh, said uh, in their article talking about Steininger's departure, saying Steininger was appointed as OMB director in January of 2020 to replace Donna Arduin, a nationally prominent slash and burn budget cutter. I mean, it's just like you could see the theme here. The theme is. How dare it's always upward. It's always upward pressure, upward pressure on the budget uh, from every angle. Everything we're talking about today is always about more upward pressure on the on the on the uh, budget. One minute upward pressure on the spending side, but yep. no response on the on the revenue side other than to continue to cut PFDs, other than to continue to take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. Horribly, yeah. horribly, horribly mis, misbalanced uh, approach, fiscal approach. It seems to me, just looking in at it, that maybe there those people served as maybe a speed bump, maybe the voice of reason on finding ways and maybe asking questions like who pays. And maybe they've been replaced by people who are more just, I'll show you the numbers. Maybe they've been replaced by people who are more, I'll just put together a flow chart for you and there you go. Uh, instead of people who may have said, wait, this might not be right. Who pays? Maybe that's what's going on there. I I I don't know. This article is just, uh, I mean, I just don't even know what to say. Then they go on to quote the chairman, uh, 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 Bert Stedman, and talking about you know, getting his opinion. Boy, everybody apparently has Stedman on speed dial these days. He's being quoted everywhere. It's like, you know, it's just so crazy. But uh, he comes in and asks him how his departure uh, would, uh, you know, how, his, how Steininger's departure would... Uh, uh, would affect the budget process during the next year. And he, and he goes on to say uh, that, you know, well, the governor has three years left in his gubernatorial run. And he goes, I highly suggest you get a competent OMB director. Donna Arduin isn't one. And I'm just like, wait, she's a nationally recognized budget. Now she may be a budget hawk, but she's a nationally recognized. You, oh, my God, you can't even, I just can't even, uh, anybody who suggests that we should cut into the size and scope of government apparently is immediately needs to be scraped off the bottom of your shoe like yesterday's dog poo. That's what it appears to be from that that point of view. Well, people go get Bert's opinion because, you know, Dunleavy effectively has abdicated uh, responsibility for uh, the fiscal portion of Alaska government to Bert. I mean, that's, that's really what's it's happened. It's true. I mean, uh, he's hiding in the mansion. Even now, he's hiding in the mansion. No comments, no press conferences, no discussions, no explanations on the vetoes, no, none of that stuff. He is radio freak. This is year one of a four-year term, radio silent so far. Yeah, and, and you know, he, he proposes a budget. He proposed a budget last year that had a full PFD. He proposed a budget the year before that had a 50-50 PFD. And, and and he doesn't back it up. I mean, he sort of lays it out there. And then Bert essentially starts the first Senate Finance Committee meeting by saying, well, we're just going to set that aside. And we're going to we're going to build our own budget here. Um, and and the and the administration doesn't defend its budget. I mean, they send Neil in to sort of get eviscerated or they did send Neil in. Now they're going to send Lacey in to sort of get eviscerated. At the first meeting is, as, as Stedman says, we're not going to pay attention to your budget. We're going to build our own. Uh, the House doesn't have any say. I mean, b- basically using the tricks that uh, uh, that Ben talked, Ben Carpenter talked about last week in his segment last week on the show, your interview with him last week, 
uh, the House gets, you know, ridden out of the equation. And, and, and the governor doesn't push back when it comes veto time. I mean, he doesn't veto, he doesn't say we're going to have, we're going to have a full PFD or we're at least going to have a POMB 5050 PFD in this budget, or we're not finished with the budget. And I'm going to, I'm going to send it back to you until we have that. He doesn't do that. He doesn't push back on, on, on the budget that gets sent to him by the, by the Senate who has run roughshod over the house. So basically, basically Burt is the, is, is the fiscal governor. I mean, he, he's running the show on the fiscal side. So yeah, the press goes and asks him because, because he's the one that's running the show uh, on the fiscal side. He decides, he decides we're going to stash $8 billion. Uh, we're going to call it prepayment, but then we're not going to treat it as prepayment. We're going to stash $8 billion from the earnings reserve into the, into the corpus create a crisis in the, in the earnings reserve, uh, or at least we're going to say we're going to create a crisis in the earnings reserve, stash $8 billion back. And the Denley administration doesn't veto the first four. They buy off on the prepayment. And the second four, they tried to veto, but failed because they, they didn't cross out the right line. Um, and so Bert gets away with that. It's, it, and, and, and the people who would, the people who have been thinking about a more responsible approach on the administration side. The people have been putting together more responsible plans on the administration side. Brian Fector, Colleen Glover, Neil Steininger, they're all gone. So I, yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's very difficult to figure out what the heck the administration is doing other than nothing. They're just going to not, they're just not going to do anything. They're going to come up with budgets. They're going to put pieces of paper on the, on the table, let the let Senate Finance, you know, throw those throw those in the trash can, uh, and then and then build their own, and then not veto it, not not try to defend their position, and let and let uh, Senate Finance veto it, and just let keep on going. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> it's amazing to watch. I mean, this is like a slow moving, slow motion train wreck. I mean, really, and you can't look away. You're watching it happen. <laughs> you could see it. And you're just wondering how many of these people who are pushing for this kind of stuff have got the golden parachute, you know, where they're ready to retire and they pull the ripcord and they don't matter because they're going to leave or they're, it's just not going to affect them because they're in that top 20, 10, 5% of income earners. And it doesn't matter to them as long as everything's taken care of and they have some kind of legacy, they pull the ripcord and they leave. It's uh, and as long as they don't have to pay for it, as long as, they <laughs> as, as long as they can find somebody else to pay for it. That's the thing. I mean, it, it, and and here we are sitting at this whole point. Number three, a weird conversation about Representative Will Stapp, who um, has taken a stand on some things this last session, um, but not uh, everything, and has made some kind of odd moves at one point or another. But you got into a conversation in regards to Will Stapp that you said is just plain strange weird uh so give, give us a rundown here it is so i i'll be honest i'm not a fan of will Stapps. i uh, represent staff i think he's i think he's part of the part of the problem not part of the solution um uh, particularly uh the latest example was the move in house finance uh toward the end of the session when he took ben carpenter's uh spending cap bill and 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 put an amendment into it uh, that essentially blew up the uh, the spending cap by another billion dollars by putting the PFD underneath the spending cap as opposed right. to outside the spending cap. Not a big fan of, of Will Stapps. I'll I'll be honest. Um, and and I do these posts on Twitter and elsewhere that that occasionally get reactions. This is one I did uh, last week. I said Representative Will Stapp and some others in the Alaska House Majority push PFD cuts because they because they claim to be no taxers. Uh, who prioritize the Alaska economy? That is, they say that that the PFD cuts are 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 okay as long as we don't have a tax because that's best for the Alaska economy. But PF, but my response was, but PFD cuts are taxes, and they have, according to ICER studies, the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy. So why do they support PFD cuts? Why does Representative Staff and others support uh, PFD cuts? Because they pr they prioritize the top twenty percent. They want to make sure the top 20% doesn't pay taxes, that only the, the lower and middle income Alaska families pay taxes. And then I got this response, and it's by a Twitter, uh, Twitter handle, a Twitter person that goes by the title of Steamboat Landing. So you can't figure out who it is. Twitter's full of 
people who use uh, who use covers for uh, what they say. But the response is hi. That this is the response. Hi, Representative Staff's district is overwhelmingly military. He is looking out for military families, most of whom are not eligible for the PFD, but would have to pay taxes if imposed. He has more E ones enlisted ones in his district than the 1%. He reflects his district. You can't hate on him for that. So basically what this, what this person is arguing, what Steamboat Landing is arguing, is that, is that Representative Stapp's position is justified because his district is mostly non-residents, non-people non who don't qualify for the PFD, e uh, military, and, and he's looking out for them to make sure they don't pay taxes. Well, the thing that's really bizarre about this is he's looking out for E1s. He's looking out for people who earn on average around $25,000 and making sure they don't pay taxes. The way that, the, that he's making sure they don't pay taxes is by using PFD cuts instead. So Alaska residents who would otherwise get PFDs but are, but are seeing their PFDs cut in order to pay for government so that the precious E1s don't don't get taxed. Alaska residents who earn 25% are seeing a tax rate, an effective tax rate through PFD cuts of 7% of 7 and above, depending upon you know, the size of their family and depending upon exactly where their, where their income uh, falls in that income bracket. But the same income bracket that covers an E1 at 25,000 takes that for, for a resident, about 7% of their, of their income is being taken uh, through PFD cuts. So represent, what, what this defense is saying, it's okay, Representative Stapp's position is okay because he's looking out for these non-residents to make sure they don't get taxed by taxing equivalent Alaska families, Alaska families with equivalent incomes heavily, 7% and above, taxing them heavily to pay for government costs so the E1s don't get taxed. We, we see this. We see this position elsewhere. I mean, we see people say, "Well, we don't want to tax, you know, people who come in during the summer uh, and work uh, uh, work uh, uh, as as transient workers uh, in the tourist industry. We don't want to tax those tax those people who work in fish plants out west, uh, who are brought up in the summer to to work in the fish plants. We we don't want to tax them because you know then employers would have to pay them more uh, to to a little bit more in order to cover the 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 tax burden they would have to pay. We certainly don't want to impose that burden. So you're, what you're doing is letting non-residents, whether they are fish workers or they are people who come up and work in the tourist season or pe people in the military, you're letting them off the hook entirely. No other state does that. You're letting them off the hook entirely by, by pushing even more of the burden onto middle and lower Alaska family, uh, resident middle and lower Alaska family residents. You're using middle and lower income Alaska Alaska residents to subsidize non-residents by not charging them for the, the cost of government while you're overcharging uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. It's just a very, it's a very strange defense. And if this is in fact, if this is in fact the motivation behind representative staff's position, if this, if this defense is in fact what he's thinking, I'm going to look after the E was E1s, I'm going to make sure they're not taxed at even if even at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families, residents here. We're going to charge them more so we can right. so we don't have to charge the non-residents. If that is in fact uh Representative Stapp's uh, position and, and his motivation, we've got him on house finance. We've got him making policy. That that may be okay, may be okay for a representative of that district, but we've got him on house finance making policy for all of the state, prioritizing non-residents over residents, penalizing residents in order to subsidize non-residents. It's just a very, it's a very bizarre defense. Look, I'm not after the military. I'm not after E1s. I'm not saying that, you know, that we ought to tax them more. I'm just saying they ought, like it happens in every other state in the District of Columbia, they ought to at least contribute some to the right. costs of Alaska. Because in every other state, if you're in the military, you pay whatever the resident or the, the 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 taxes in the local areas, whether it's a sales tax or an income tax or whatever it is, you pay those things. It doesn't exempt you from it. And to have somebody else 
who is a local resident have to pay a disproportionate share or carry the full load, as in the case is what uh, this person just said in defense of staff, is insanity. I mean, it's just it's crazy. I mean, it 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 may have made it may have made sense. At least it was hidden back in the early 20 teens when we were using savings to 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 pay for the deficits. So yeah, you could say that current Alaska residents were getting a free ride because they weren't paying taxes. And so non-residents, it was okay for them to get a free ride too. But in 2017, when we kicked over and started taxing middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, that argument no longer made sense. If we're going to start taxing middle and lower income Alaska families, we need to tax non-residents as well. Well, Brad, I appreciate you coming in. Thanks for calling it out, calling it like you see it. I think uh, these are things we need to be thinking about, and we can see the trend and the trajectory right now to this dependency state. And it's very concerning for me for the future. And uh, extrapolating this out, it's going to be a very, very difficult time. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) I didn't mean to just snort, but... (laughs) Oh, Randy, Randy, Randy. Every other state cuts their PFD down to zero. Alaska is the only state that doesn't cut their PFD down to zero. Brandy, we're the only state with a PFD. And the, oh my God. It, it, this is part of the problem, Brad. People just don't understand the mechanisms of this government. They don't understand the funding mechanisms. They don't understand how everything works. And so they just arbitrarily are like, oh yes, no, no taxes. We don't need that. That's bad. Not understanding what they're losing in the long run. I mean, Does does Randy, do you think Randy really understands what happens when his PFD is cut? It's not what it what it's doing is 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 going over as a tax avoidance dividend to benefit the top 20 percent. So they don't have to pay taxes. So they don't have to they don't have any burden from from increasing the cost of government. They don't have any, any disincentive to increase the cost of government because they keep they keep shoving it down to middle and lower income Alaska families. What Randy's P what what the PFD cut that Randy and every other middle and lower income Alaska family is suffering, what the PFD cut is doing, it's going to indemnify, going to shield the top 20% from having to pay any taxes. And 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 they love people like Randy saying, Oh yeah, well, I don't want it. I, mean, I don't think I'm entitled to it. And they're saying, Well, we'll take it. We'll we'll take the advantage of it. We'll use it to to avoid uh, to avoid taxes on us. Thank you very much. We'll keep that money in our bank account. Um, it's I, I don't think they I don't think they truly understand. I truly don't think they understand the 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 economic effect of what's going on with PFD cuts. Well, and I think that's obvious from a previous comment. He said, "Please don't zero in on me with a state income tax. I'm in the bottom eighty percent and work out the elements in my private sector blue job. I want to keep as much of my hard earned wages as I can." Well, if it was a flat income tax and you're in the lower eighty percent, you'd make much more with a full PFD than you would in any kind of tax at the lower eighty percentile. I mean, the, it, you know that. It's obvious that people just don't understand the mechanisms of what's going on here. Yeah. Well, it's uh, and and the top 20 percent takes advantage of that. I mean, they'll take they'll take Randy and other and others who make similar statements and run with it and say, well, they don't want the PFD or they think it's fair that their PFD is cut or they think it's fair that 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 they don't get a share of Alaska wealth. Fine. We'll take it for our benefit. We'll use it as a shield to protect us from having to pay for the increased cost of government. We'll, we'll use it as a as an indemnity. We'll, we'll use that money to pay our share of government costs. And so we'll get we'll get the benefits of free government while uh, while middle and lower income Alaska families pay for it. It's 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 it, it is. Yeah, it's part of what we deal with here here in Alaska. I mean, it's the, the economics are, are not obvious <coughs> uh, and, until you think about them, but the economics are not obvious. And so the top 20 percent continue to take advantage of that. I mean, yeah. that, that's that's where you get statements like don't tax me to pay your PFD. We aren't taxing you to pay our PFD. The PFD comes from permanent fund earnings. Thank you very much. Fully what funded, would, right? Fully what, funded. What, <coughs> what would we, we would be taxing you for is to pay your share of government spending. Yeah. Just like on, with a broad-based tax, we'd be taxing non-residents to pay their share and taxing others to pay their share as well. We're taxing you to pay your share of government spending. What you want, when you tell me, <coughs> don't tax me. What you want 
is you want continued free government, no matter how much they're spending. And you want it paid for by taking money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. You want free government. Right. You and the top 20% want free government, regardless of how much spending there is. You want free government and you're perfectly willing to take the money out of the Randy's and the others in the in middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for it. Thank you very much. And that and that's just not that's not equitable. And it has the largest <laughs> adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. The big thing that bothers me is uh, is this trend in all of the things we just talked about today, this trend that's becoming very obvious that it is a dependency cycle and that cycle is increasing. That every problem, the solution is obviously government. The solution is obviously more government money, which in turn, it's that self-reinforcing thing. It's, it's, that's where we're at in the state. We're going to be dependent completely on the state in the future, if we continue this trend, there will be no industry. The private industry will not be important. Nothing else. It, it's it's <coughs> it's going to be horrific. Uh, and, make it happier. And and there isn't a break on it, Michael. I mean, the break is the the lobbyists are pushing it. The top twenty percent, the donor class, are pushing you know increased government spending. Oh, I need child care. State, you need to pay for that. I mean, it, it's every there. The top twenty percent continues to push for more and more government because they don't have to pay for it. Hammond recognized that decades ago. Hammond said, if you're going to cut the PFD, keep the income tax. Not that, not that I want you to have an income tax, but it's a sort of Damocles hanging over the top 20%. So they will push back on spending. So they will know that if, if spending increases beyond traditional revenues, they're going to have to pay a share of it. And it will hang there like the sort of Damocles and they will push back on spending. Well, the legislature, for whatever reason, chose not to do that, chose not to have the income tax as a contingent as a contingency sitting out there. So when, when push came to shove in the middle 20, 20 teens, the top 20 percent said, take it out of the PFD, take it out of Randy's pocket, take it out of Michael's pocket, take it out of you know everybody listening to this program, likely take it out of all of their pockets. Just don't top 20 percent saying just don't take it out of mine. Oh, and by the way, increase government for me, would you? You know, let's have defined benefits because I want to, you know, I want to have a, a better pension program. Let's have increased K through 12 spending. Let's have, you know, child care for me, increase spending. And I'm not going to stop it because I don't have to pay for it. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Brad, thanks so much. I appreciate it, my friend. Mike, Michael, as always, thanks for having me on. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.